Shortly after my first lesson in the Super Cub for tailwheel training, somebody broke the airplane. Now it wasn't major, but it did require the engine to get pulled. So Dennis and I visited the hangar to have a look and see what the progress was like. But clearly this airplane was not going to be flying today. Uh, this is actually the Super Cub's engine. And usually when you do have it apart, now there's an opportunity that if you spot anything else that's worn out, it's a good time to rejuvenate it or replace it or whatever. And I think he replaced the camshaft in it. And uh, he's in the process of reassembling. At this stage, looks like he's going to be reinstalling the pistons into the cylinders. So without getting into the details of what happened, it was a minor prop strike, but it required a complete engine teardown and a bulk inspection, which is non-destructive testing of the crankshaft and connecting rods and something about measuring the prop flange, which I barely understand. So the bottom line is, we need to go find a different airplane to fly today. And luckily, Dennis has the keys to basically every hangar. So I definitely wasn't disappointed, because the airplane we ended up with has been on my list for a long time to check out. Way back when I started glider training, this was the type of airplane that was used as the tow plane. This is the Belanca Cetabria. And it was amazing to see what the tow pilot could do with this thing. The aileron spade reduces control force because as soon as you deflect it, it catches the air and helps pull on the aileron. Right. So I was excited at the chance to get to fly this thing and use it as an excuse to fit in some upset recovery training into my tailwheel flying. Master switch on, and then we're going to start it on the left mag only. Clear. The last time I did spins was more than a decade ago, and it was in a Cessna 150. So I know spinning this Atabria is going to be a pretty shocking experience, but I'm looking forward to it. All right, enough of that drama. Let's go flying. I level it out again, and I want you to play with the airplane. I want you to feel it out. See yeah. where, the, where it differs from the Super Cub. All right, I'll just try to do a little S turn. Yeah, I gotta break the habit of leading with the rudder. Yeah, a little bit. Glider pilot. What was that? Uh, so you had two exercises. You had turns on a heading, and yeah, that rolls on a heading or rolls on a point, they call it. Yeah. And that's really just the ability to rock yeah. it back and forth 30 degrees without changing where the nose is pointing. Yeah. That's good. Like a zone. Yeah, that was too much. Okay. Yeah, try not, to, try not to think about it. Just do it. Let me show you. So really what you want to do is you want to be... Straight down one more. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, okay. I have you visual. Yeah, I got to just play with it be more aggressive. Yeah. All right, so let me try again. So don't lead with the rudder. Just do it and make it happen. Yeah. There you go. Well, hit the right. And don't pause. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, and then the other one was the, other uh, one is the fish tails, and that's basically you yeah, do you lead with the rudder, but keep level. everything keep everything level and keep the pitch attitude the same. I feel like I can do that better. Well, I'm more of a slipping kind of guy. It's really just to give you familiarity with the response of the airplane, right? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, All right. I like it. Let's start a left turn. Let's do a steep turn here, just to loosen up the flying muscles. Yeah, just make it feel right. A little bit too much left rudder, use off on it a bit. Yep. So although similar, this airplane is definitely different than the Super Cub. So it was cool to play with it a little bit before we really started flying it. This plane forces you to look out anyway, because yep. you've got nothing else to... As far as remaining VFR is concerned, I mean, these type of little scattered were cool, right? Yeah, I know we're going to... I'll never do one day away. Nobody's going to shit out here for that. Yeah, so the G's should just be putting me in my seat. I shouldn't be feeling any side floating. That's right. Yep. Good. So just because you've got an airplane that can go upside down, doesn't mean you should. Unless you've got a qualified instructor and you're at a safe altitude, which we are. So let's get this girl upside down in the context of doing some upset recovery training. What are people's tendencies when they're inverted? They're, they're seeing that they're either upside down or in some strange kind of a position and their tendency is to pull. Right. And the problem with that is that if you're not used to what it is that you're doing, yeah. especially if you're stalled, yeah. you're never going to unstall the airplane and you're not going to solve the problem. Right. That's why I said it's not the airplane that's aerobatic, it's the pilot. It's the typical tendency for the guy to say, oh, I'm going to roll my airplane. Dennis is referring to the wannabe airshow pilot who thinks it's not a big deal to try rolling an airplane. So we're definitely not recommending trying that. We're just looking at this as the context in which some accidents can happen. 
with the classic watch this moment, and it often doesn't end well. What they don't realize is that the wing is lifting up, the gravity is pulling down, but when the airplane's upside down, the wing is pulling down also. Yeah. Because it's lifting perpendicular to its airfoil. Right. So if I was to roll the airplane upside down right now, what do you imagine is going to happen? It's going to go, goes down upside down. Right. So you roll it around, and then it goes, oh crap, and then I, my next tendency is going to go, oh! And then yeah. I gotta pull it out. Yeah. Right? Coming up over the line, the west. Yeah, and then you get the four G's and you and then you pull up the G's and yeah. you overspeed the airplane, etc. etc. and then right. bad things happen. Yeah. It's the pilot, not the airplane, that's aerobatic at the end of the day. So if you screw it up, you can still break an aerobatic airplane. The flip side though is that if flown properly, most airplanes will do what you tell them to. But let's leave that kind of flying to Bob Hoover. Okay, we're not all Bob Hoover. But at the end of the day, it's still a good idea to really know how to fly your airplane if you need to recover from an unusual attitude, such as being inverted. It could happen from at wake turbulence encounter, even at cruise altitude. So that's why getting upset recovery training is a great idea for almost any pilot, regardless of the type of flying and the type of aircraft you plan to fly. We're going to basically show a entry into where the airplane has essentially either stopped flying or you lost control or both and then just really try to quickly get out of it again because that's the essence of it. And just for clarification at this point I want to mention that I'm obviously editing this video it's from a longer lesson I'm cutting it down to a short chunk that's more exciting and digestible. So for the first part of this lesson we worked on stall recognition and basically trying to avoid a spin before it even becomes incipient but I'm gonna skip to the part where we focus on actual spin training. Depends on the airplane, you know, like a lot of them are basically if you just let go, everything will sort itself out. Right. But that's easier said than done sometimes. People will pull because yeah. they're panicking. They're pulling at the ground. Or they're thinking that by pulling they're going to fix something and without appreciating the aerodynamic reality of what's going on, right. uh, that pulling is in vain. Traditional spin training has been a controversial subject because the entry technique that's trained is very intentional and it's not exactly the real world scenario. So hopefully most instructors will at some point in your training address the real world scenarios. But as far as the traditional training, it's very intentional, it's not entirely realistic. But that's really the way to purposely enter one as if you're, you know, in an air show. Yeah, and that's not how it really happens. But what the hell, we're in an aerobatic airplane, let's do an air show spin. In all seriousness, spins are fun, but they create a significant amount of disorientation and dramatic physiological effects. So it's a good thing to demonstrate just so you can feel how disorienting it can be. But I agree that it's not realistic, so we'll talk about the real world applications of inadvertent stall spin accidents and how it happens shortly. This is the typical, uh, in screws and stuff, the uh, the spin entry, which is just not realistic. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring the nose up, and then uh, just as it stalls, we're going to pull up briskly and tap on the left rudder, and she'll spin. So we're going to go ahead and finish it now. Yeah. We're clear. We're all clear. Okay, so we're going to fully stall it, yank the stick back, and, yeah. and then rudder. Yeah. Okay, recover, very easy, see there too, too abrupt of a push on the nose. When I tried to put her down, yeah. And you could have gone inverted in the thing, All right? which is not a, the most horrible thing to do, but that really stresses the airplane in negative G, Right. if you would have gone right up and over. Yeah. So that was good times, just playing it again from another view, because I think we did almost three rotations on that one. Uh, the tiny bit of miscommunication we had there was that Back when I did my training, I used to hold the inputs until my instructor said recover. So I was basically waiting for Dennis to tell me to recover, so I think we were playing chicken without knowing it. Uh, do you want to just try one more? Just to want to feel that. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, let's try and recover after one fully developed turn. Yeah, I was waiting, yeah, I was waiting for you to say it. Oh, jeez, no, don't wait for me. <laughs> Sorry, man, that's what I was waiting for. Oh. Uh, so that's why when it, when it came time, I was like, yeah, we're spinning pretty fast. So I'm ready to recover any time now. <laughs> No, you recover when you when you want to. Okay. That's why I was abrupt because I was yeah. I was like, yeah, that's a fully developed spin. But uh, but definitely you don't have to push so okay. much as just let go. Yeah. The airplane is trimmed to a certain speed. Okay. The weight of the motor is up front, and it's gonna want to pull its nose down on its own without a whole lot of prompting. So it's worth noting that the disorientation effect is so severe that even after just discussing that I wasn't gonna push, I was only gonna let go. I still did it again and I pushed. It's just so dramatic and you really can only experience it by actually doing a spin. 
probably been 10 years since I've done one, but they're a lot of fun and they're safe if done properly in a properly certified aircraft within the proper weight and balance envelope. Airplanes that are certified for spinning also have a very specific weight and balance envelope that you have to be in to do them. If your center of gravity is too far aft, bad things can happen and you may not be able to recover from a spin once you get into one. Okay, recover. Oh, I said it again, eh? Again, yeah. Sorry. That's all right. So yeah, the disorientation effect is very dramatic. And like I said, I, I knew what I wanted to do. My brain knew it, but it was just so dramatic to be sitting there looking at the ground, spinning toward it. And it's just hard to fight your instincts. In a real world situation, you got the ground rushing effect when you're at a low altitude. So you do not want to find yourself in this position at a low altitude. So let's get into some real world applications now. This stick feels like there's so much movement to it. Well, it's a lot like more sensitive in pitch. Yeah. I feel because like I had it so far back to hold it in the spin, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, but that's I mean, why I say, but did you actually remember pushing or just let it go? I remember pushing. Yeah. Look at it this way. Bring it nose up more. Like try it almost like we're beginning into the spin again. And if I let go, yeah, yeah, I'll just let go and see yeah, what it does. Yeah, we'll <laughs> Yeah, no coaxing required, right? No, no coaxing required. All right. I think it was just trying to find neutral and going past it, but what I should have done well, is just let go. Part of that is remembering, like most stick and rudder pilots fly with their forearm on their right knee. Yeah. So you can kind of get used to where neutral is. It's yeah. where your hand naturally falls, and that's, you know, uh, you want that's kind of home base. That's where you go back to whenever you have a problem. Right. But if it's something involving slower flight, then you want to go slightly forward of that. That's yeah. all. Yeah. That's good. I mean, I'm happy with just knowing that I feel how this airplane spins. Okay. Which is quite exciting. <laughs> and I think also the pushing forward is that I'm used to in the Cessnas that you did have to kind of feel like you pushed forward. Well, look, I mean, there's airplanes that uh, if you stalled it, and let's say it was like a 182 or something, and you had, you know, two adults in the back and luggage in the back and everything else, it isn't as inclined to drop the nose. Right. So you may have to sort of go, wow, it's stalling and I let go and it's still not nose down enough to make me happy yeah. now I am going to have to yeah. push it down on purposely right but you know, in the interest of safety and stability, most airplanes are always slightly nose heavy. So in reality, if you let, just let them do what they're designed to do, nothing bad's going to happen. That's right. So in terms of creating a realistic stall spin scenario, let's recreate the situation where you overshoot the turn to final from base. So the, uh, the tuck under spin, which is usually precipitated by a stall caused by the guy adding too much inside rudder trying to hasten the turn to final. Yeah. We're going to do it at fairly low speed. This thing doesn't have flaps, so it's not as easy to simulate. So we're going to pretend we're overshooting and we're kind yeah, of... Yeah, we're, we're lining up, we're turning base to final. And we're like way... Yeah, we've overshot we're, it. We're overshot it and we turn, but we're not turning fast enough, so we add more rudder and stall it. There it goes. Yeah. There it goes, right? Yeah, now, wow. Do you think you can recover from that altitude? At 500 feet above ground? Yeah. Hell no. No. Yeah. That's so crazy. a lot of people don't realize, but that's how easy it is. And those are the kinds of things that most people don't teach. Yep. Well, this right. is the scenario based, yeah. And that, that was like a textbook, that's the way you would enter a spin, right? You over add rudder into that's it. That's the textbook way that a pilot without intending to would enter a spin from a very normal maneuver. Yeah. So the person that has a, a, a very quiet stall horn or a non-functioning stall horn could very well end up uh, doing that without really realizing it. And on top of that, that little bit of abruptness, yep. right? That's all it takes. As long as you're smooth, a lot of times you can prevent the problem that would otherwise happen from being abrupt. Yeah. And again, this brings back the point that it's the pilot, not the airplane, that's aerobatic. It's all about energy management and smooth flying. And again, Bob Hoover is the man. He's the master of smooth flying and energy management. It's a combination of the speed and the g-force. I mean, look at it this way. Here's, let me have it for a sec. Here's, yeah, it. here's a 90, right? Or 85, well above stall speed. But yeah. you can see that I could... Yeah, it was my stall up. horn at 90, right? Yeah, accelerated stall. So it doesn't take much. So speaking of energy management and smooth flying, this airplane doesn't have flaps, so it's interesting to try to work out your circuit planning and get into a good approach profile. So let's go land it. All right, so I want 75 for the approach and then get her down to closer to 60 over the threshold. Right. Gotcha. By the time you're over the threshold, you should essentially be in the three-point attitude. Okay. 
And right now you can see with 75, without flaps, 75 is level, right? You're yeah. in cruise attitude almost. Touch a trimmer. Yep, trim it a bit nose up if you want. And just hold it nose down as you're approaching so that it comes back to that trim position naturally. Yeah. Like you're off in November is final was zero nine for the grass. And I'm high again, eh? Yep. Pull the power back. Anytime you say to yourself, I'm high, step one. Power, yeah. Power off. So you gotta start kind of bleeding the speed out maybe a little bit earlier. Problem is without the visibility is that your brain tells you that you're going slow because your nose up. Right. As long as the airplane still feels solid yep. and you're transferring more of your directional control to your feet, then uh, you're still quite safe on this thing. It doesn't stall until you're down around 50. Okay. I do need a little slip here because I got energy that I don't want. So the profile's not bad, but I'm a little fast. So get her down a little bit more. Victor off in November is final zero 09 for the cross. All right, let everything stabilize. Going for 70. Not gonna stretch the glide. Down at 65. Yeah, you're good. You can pull the power back right from here, basically. Yeah, let's start to get her to the three point. Beautiful. There we go. Very nice. Brakes. Yeah, that felt good. Start back and lots nice. of brakes. Those brakes are effective. Nice. Yeah, it's just a matter of just using just the right amount. And if you feel any tendency for it to nose over, you immediately release the brakes. Okay. That landing went well, and the next thing we did was pavement landing, where I was completely humbled because that is a lot more difficult, and I'm going to dedicate a whole video to it. It's completely unforgiving. There's no margin for error, and if you come in with side load, you can quickly get yourself into trouble, whereas on grass, it's very forgiving. Anyway, sorry this video was so loaded down with disclaimers and context, but I'm starting to cross into this land of making instructional videos, which I'm very concerned about. Uh, just My videos are for entertainment slash information and the start of a conversation that you should have with your instructor. Now obviously I'm using pieces of real instruction from an awesome instructor, Dennis, but the fact is I'm editing and I'm not qualified to be an instructor, so I may be losing certain pieces of important context, so I don't want my videos to be looked at as instructional, uh, so please keep that in mind. Anyways, for more virtual ride-along flying videos like this, please subscribe, and uh, keep on keeping your flight chop sharp. Wherever you are in the world, share your aviation. Share aviation. A network for pilots by pilots.